Good afternoon. Good afternoon and thank you all for joining us for the relaunch of our French series in partnership with The Hill. I couldn't be happier to welcome a very distinguished guest for our very first discussion, Robert Zelik. Robert is a former Deputy Secretary of State, U.S. Trade Representative and President of the World Bank. He is now a senior fellow at the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government. He drew on his extensive experience to write his latest book, America in the World, a history of U.S. diplomacy and foreign policy that we will discuss tonight. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Bob. Joining him on stage, on our virtual stage, and leading the discussion is Steve Clements, editor at large for The Hill and a dear friend of our embassy. My dear Steve, thank you for being here tonight. Before I hand it over to you, I just wanted to I just wanted to remind our audience uh, we will announce our guest for January very soon. So make sure to keep an eye and eye out for that announcement. Uh, without revealing too much, I can let you know that he is one of the countless experts who commented Bob Zolik's book, calling it, I quote, a wonderful read. <laughs> So, over to you, Steve. Well, Ambassador, thank you and greetings to everyone. Um, what an honor it is, I, I know, for uh, both myself and Ambassador Zelik to help with the relaunch of the French series and, and, and to do it in a virtual way uh, here online, you know, which uh, we can all be in our homes and, and we can all, you know, have our own copies. It's hard to carry these to another place when you're there, but, you know, we have them in our home and put them back on the shelf when we're done. This is uh, Bob's book, America in the World, A History of U.S. Diplomacy and foreign policy. And we're going to crack it open in a moment with Ambassador Zelik. I want to say that I've really enjoyed this book. And it's one of these, uh, I highly recommend it in advance of our discussion as a holiday present for those who are, are, are looking for it. Um, but, but let me um, open this up. And I'm going to say we're going to speak up to each other for about half an hour. And then we really want to open up to all of you. You can raise your hand. Uh, and the ambassador staff will interact with you to get your questions, or you can actually, as I understand it, go ahead and type out your questions and post them, and they'll be directed to me. We'll get through as many of them uh, in a lightning round way. One thing you'll know about Ambassador Zelik is um, he can work through questions very quickly, so we'll get through a lot of them, uh, um, I believe. So, uh, Bob, it's a pleasure to be with you this evening. You know, I'm used to you as a World Bank president. I'm used to you as a deputy U.S. trade representative. I'm used to you having no time where did you get the time and why did you write America in the World, this history of U.S. foreign policy and diplomacy? Well, Steve, let me just start by thanking you and particularly for the ambassador. It's so wonderful to do this at the French embassy, the, the home of the masters of diplomacy, to be able to talk about uh, the American version. So <laughs> when I was in government, I often drew on history as I thought about policy problems. And so... Uh, over the past four years, as you may know, we've had a slight interregnum politically, and uh, it gave me an opportunity. Is that, is that your term for it? <laughs> <laughs> it gave me an opportunity uh, to work with some of the dead people as opposed to the alive people in the, in the history. <laughs> um, but I wanted to encourage others, particularly in the next generation, to think about applying history to problem solving. Because, as, as you know, many foreign policy courses these days uh, rely on international relations theory. And that's intellectually fun, but it seemed a little distant to me than the practical problem solving that I was involved with. Um, as you know, Henry Kissinger wrote a book titled Diplomacy uh, in the 1990s, where he used history uh, to talk about foreign policy. Not surprisingly, it tended to reflect somewhat of the European real politic perspective. Mm -hmm. And so my idea with this book is to share more of the American experience uh, and ideas. And I suppose coming back to next generation, in, in the various posts I held, I often would uh, perhaps torture my younger colleagues by asking what they knew about history. I had no idea what they learned. And uh, my sense was insofar as they learned any history, it had really started from World War II and then in the Cold War. And uh, the first 150 years of American history, while short by European standards, have a lot of very interesting people and events. So I wanted to bring some of those back from, from the mists of time. And the approach I took uh, as you mentioned, was to, to use stories. I wanted to 
uh, appeal to a broader audience. So each chapter focuses on uh, a person or a few people and a particular episode. And my idea here was to describe uh, with some color about events, but then also to offer my assessment and in a sense, trying to encourage the reader to think about, well, what would they do in, in a practical sense uh, to deal with these problems? Well, you know, one, one of the, the people that you used to work with, uh, Christina Sevilla, who is now a deputy U.S. trade representative, was on your staff at the U.S. trade. She said you used to kind of taunt your team with the fact that they ought to know a lot more about Cordell Hull. So, you, you know, it's, it, it was sort of out of left field for them. So they all were running off to read about Cordell Hull. Why, why was Cordell Hull your favored personality at that time as you were taunting your trade representative staff? Well, Cordell Hull was uh, Secretary of State under Franklin Roosevelt. He's actually the longest serving uh, Secretary of State. It was so from 1933 to 1944 when he stepped down. But he was primarily interested in trade. He had come from the Congress um, and he, uh, his, his main contribution was something called the Reciprocal Trade Agreements Act of 1934. And the reason why this was important, some of you may recall, was that in 1930, we had the Smoot-Hawley tariff. So it said deepened the Great Depression. Our average tariff was about 59%. Uh, percent. And what, uh, what, what Hull managed to do was to get a bill that would look shockingly short today. It was only three pages long, but it created a regime shift. And what it managed to do was it delegated to the executive branch the authority to negotiate trade agreements to lower tariffs. And, uh, and for the first 150 years of American history, tariffs were all set by Congress. There was a log rolling exercise. So this is a big shift in power, which frankly continued on through my area of USTR uh, through to today. But uh, the executive branch always has to fight to regain it. So that's the battle for trade promotional authority or fast track. Now Hull negotiated 28, 31 agreements with 28 countries. He lowered tariffs, but equally important, he created the principles uh, in those agreements that was the basis for the GATT system in 1947. Mm. So uh, when we were in 2001, had to regain trade promotion authority, we were right in the line of Cordell Hull. But the other idea was that, you see, Hull used these bilateral agreements to change the multilateral system, ultimately with the GATT. And part of our strategy at that time was to use multilateral agreements in a competitive way with both the regional and the global system. So. That was Mr. Hull's legacy. Well, look, I do not want to torture our wonderful guest tonight with the micro micro. But the problem with reading your book is it's very hard to get out of your head. You know, one, and I'll tell the audience that what I really like, you know, when Bob says he wanted to spend some time with dead people, he really does. I mean, hundreds of years old dead people uh, like Robert Morris, who, you know, uh, was really the Secretary of Treasury during the period of the United States, you know, during the Articles of Confederation and recommended Alexander Hamilton and pushed him to be Secretary of the Treasury in the uh, uh, post-Constitution United States. And, and you know, his making 400% profit on sending ginseng from the Appalachian Mountains to Canton. I'll never be able to get that out of my head and I'm never sure where I'll be able to use that information other than at this moment. But let's not go there. Let's go to the French. In the hundreds of years now of American history, who got it right with the French who didn't get it right with the French? Who managed the best deals with the French? Let's, let's, and then maybe later we'll get Ambassador Etienne to see if he agrees with you. Well, the one who got it right was our first diplomat, the one I start with the introduction, which is Ben Franklin. So our, our first two treaties were with France in 1778. And then relying on our French ally, we were able to negotiate our independence from, from Great Britain. But uh, in addition to being a wonderful story, what, what's interesting was how many of those issues, in a sense, resonate today. So, so think what Franklin had to do. He was negotiating from war to peace, which is a problem we've dealt with for, for 200 years. How do you link your military actions with your political objectives? He was playing a relatively weak hand. And this struck me because uh, when Secretary of Defense Mattis stepped down, he observed the United States no longer had total domain dominance. And I reflected, well, in much of our history, we didn't have domain, total domain dominance. And you have to conduct diplomacy sometimes without the full strongest hand. Uh, he, Franklin really was the inventor of public diplomacy. 
I mean, at the time that he went to France, no one knew the United States, but, but Franklin was, was famous. And he used that uh, and his reputation to appeal to French, French sense of, of, of style. His, his image appeared everywhere. It was on snuff boxes, it was on rings. Supposedly Louis XVI got so frustrated that he, a, one of Franklin's fans, he gave a chamber pot with Franklin's uh, image on, <laughs> on the bottom. And then Franklin had to negotiate uh, with his own <laughs> delegation. I'm sure the ambassadors had this experience. He worked pretty well with John Jay. With John Adams, he said, uh, always an honest man, uh, often an intelligent one, but in some things and some circumstances, absolutely out of his mind. And he certainly gave the French a difficulty. He had to negotiate with allies in Congress through excellent French diplomacy. Uh, Franklin and his colleagues were ordered by Congress not to act unless they had gotten France's approval. And of course, they ignored this and cut a preliminary deal uh, with the British. And, and then poor Franklin had the job of explaining this uh, to the French and then asking for uh, another loan in the process. Um, so uh, what you also can see with Franklin though, and this is sort of, I try to work in some, some lessons for diplomacy across the ages. He had his ability to keep his eye on the principal issue. And, and he had a sense of timing. So one of his colleagues actually in 1777, when the US was in dire straits said, look, you know, we need to tell the French, you know, you need to support us or we're gonna throw in our hand. And uh, Franklin thought that wasn't a very good idea. So instead he uh, waited until the victory of Saratoga to negotiate the 1778 treaty. There's some wonderful stories of espionage and one that I guess- So negotiating from strength in other words. Well, or, or at least, uh, an advantage, because I'm not <laughs> sure the United States gained full strength at that point. But he also, a little different than the John Bolton School, he, he emphasized that even small gestures can make a big difference uh, to great people and events. Now, to top off the story, when, when the United States negotiators violated Congress's instructions and cut the preliminary deal with Britain, Congress asked the French delegation in the United States, do you want to file a protest? And it's one of my wonderful lines. The French representative, he said, great powers never complain, but they remember and feel. <laughs> <laughs> and interestingly enough, that figure goes to the next point, which is he was the treasury negotiator in the Louisiana Purchase, if you want to talk about that one. Yeah, well, I, 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 I do. I do want to mention just as a little sidebar, since you mentioned John Bolton, who, like you, they, you were both sort of acolytes to James Baker, uh, whom, whom uh, uh, Peter Baker and, and Susan Glasser have written about recently, but Philippe Etienne, our French ambassador to the United States right now, is peppered throughout the Bolton book. And I can't tell whether uh, Bolton wants to put his face on the bottom of a chamber pot or whether he really likes him, but we'll, we'll leave that for another uh, conversation. But, 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 but tell us about the, the Louisiana Purchase. So as we were, as we were saying to the ambassador, uh, this was one heck of a deal. The United States paid about $15 million for Louisiana about four cents an acre. But the bigger story here was that, you know, after the peace, the temporary peace with Britain in 1801, Napoleon was, was looking to field. And he was looking, one possibility was to the Middle East, uh, but he, one idea was to recreate the French empire in, uh, in North America. But, and the three components were uh, Haiti and the sugar and coffee islands in the Caribbean, which were very wealthy, important islands. New Orleans, and then all the land behind it to provide some of the uh, raw materials. And the real problem came out of the efforts uh, to reestablish French authority in Haiti, which ended up being a nightmare, a large loss of French forces in part through, through disease. And then of course, as uh, war loomed again with Great Britain, this empire would have to struggle with the notion of, of the Royal Navy in between. So um, Jefferson had been signaling uh, how uh, despite all his affection for France, that if France recovered uh, Louisiana from Spain, which it had been given after the Seven Years' War, that this would pit France and the United States against one another. And interestingly, there were two French diplomats that played a very important role. There was a man named Louis-André uh, Pichon, who was only 29 years old. Talleyrand sent him. His mm. reports were very, very good. He was quite an influential uh, sort of emissary. And then we had this treasury minister, Francois Marbois, who had been serving in the United States before, 
He actually had married a wealthy uh, Philadelphia woman, uh, a common European practice. Um, and uh, he was given the job to negotiate the agreement by Napoleon in part because they thought that Talleyrand would probably take too much of a cut. But, but the best quote is from, from Talleyrand after the deal is done. When asked about the extent of the purchase, which recall France had, had acquired from Spain, he replied, you must take it as we received it. And then he was asked, <laughs> but what did you take from Spain? And Talleyrand shrugged and said, I don't know. I can give you no direction. And then he said, you have made a noble bargain for yourselves, and I suppose you'll make the most of it. <laughs> and, and allegedly, Napoleon had even said, well, if there, the idea that there's lack of clarity about borders is maybe a good thing. If there weren't, we'd have to create it. <laughs> so the United States later got some additional land from Spain as, as part of the negotiation. But, you know, the, from an American point of view, the debate has long been whether Jefferson's diplomacy was lucky because of the circumstances or, or was he good? And I think there's a, there's a mixture there. Again, like Franklin, he had a clear sense of objectives. And I, I can't underscore this enough because anybody that's been part of negotiations knows it's easy to get drawn off. It's easy to kind of get drawn down cubby holes of secondary issues. And Jefferson kept focused on what he, what he really wanted. He was quite agile with his tactics. Uh, he kept open channels of communication, including with the private sector. So the idea of a sale eventually really came from the DuPonts, which were a combination French set of American family. He had a good sense of timing. Um, mm. He didn't rush to the deal. Maybe Alexander Hamilton would have pushed too quickly, but he also wasn't passive, as perhaps some of our presidents have been. He used domestic politics in Congress, which obviously wasn't well understood in Paris of, of 1802 or 1803 as part of his threat. And then the, the wonderful part is for all of the visionary nature of, of Thomas Jefferson. He could be pragmatic when he needed to be. So recall, after the purchase came through, he started to ask himself, well, do we have constitutional authority for this? Because remember, he argued with Hamilton about uh, a, a more narrow view of constitutional authority. And he almost decided he would have to seek a constitutional amendment. And Madison says, no, 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 we're not gonna, we're not gonna do that. And then the other part of it was, remember, the United States had to, had to pay for this. And he ended up using the bonds that, uh, that Hamilton had helped create, which I think had 6% interest to, to pay for this. So there was a practical nature of this transaction. Fascinating. Well, you know, we'll have to, you know, go back at some point and ask, okay, who, who amongst the pantheon of foreign policy players in America got it really, you know, did the worst with France, you know, the current occupants of the White House notwithstanding, but let's not go there right now. One of the things I like, you know, when you talk about and you're in the book, you're writing about Robert Morris and, you know, shipping ginseng from the Appalachians to Canton, which I can't get out of my head. But many other bits of the tapestry of American foreign policy history, trade history, etc., is you talk about the five traditions of American foreign policy and, and you know, really the five currents, the rivers that, you know, and to hang all of this on so that we're not just hearing lots of micro detail. Can you share with us in our audience in a, in a clear way, the, those five traditions, or I will if you don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I'll take a crack at it. Um, so as, as we mentioned, uh, I, I try to use stories to talk about ideas, but I do use these five traditions as a framework. And the first one is one that I think you and I actually first met over. It was the yeah. North America. And this is intriguing because obviously in 19th century history, like the Louisiana Purchase, North America is at the heart of our foreign policy. It was also true in the 20th century. We almost went to war again with, uh, with Mexico. If you think about the Cuban Missile Crisis, the great nuclear showdown of the Cold War, that's in the Caribbean. And then uh, NAFTA also looms quite important in terms of uh, the relationship with our neighbor in Mexico. But yet, if you go on most foreign policy websites, you'll hear see reports about Europe and Asia and uh, Middle East and maybe something about Africa and Latin America, but almost never about sort of uh, North America. If you ask, however, the American public what they're interested in, you know, you'll come across topics like immigration, uh, organized crime and narcotics, sort of economic development, environmental topics. That's at the heart of the North American agenda. But the bigger picture here is one that Ronald Reagan actually identified in the speech when he launched his campaign in 1979. You almost couldn't imagine this as a campaign speech. He mm. said, you know, it's time we stop thinking about our nearest neighbors as foreigners, and it's important to make Mexico and Canada stronger. Mm. 
Now, what he had in mind is, frankly, what I was trying to do over the past 30 years in different jobs was that the stronger that North America is, economically, three democracies, uh, uh, demographics that are better than the rest of the world, uh, and, and uh, in terms of how we uh, have energy self-sufficiency, that is a stronger platform for uh, all three countries globally. So it's right. part of our global position. The second topic is trade, transnationalism, and technology. And here, what I wanted to underscore was from the very founding of the United States, trade was more than a matter of economic efficiency. It was right. about our key partnerships in the world. And recall, this was a young republic in a world of, 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 uh, of empires and, and mercantilism. And so it tried to pry open the door for private sector actors. And if you think about much of American foreign policy today or in the past, whether it's missionaries or engineers or soldiers of fortune, it's the private sector role. And as part of that, the importance of technology, which I also draw out a little bit in the book. Mm -hmm. um, then the third is the role of alliances. And here, you know, for the first 150 years after our alliance with France, the United States tries to avoid alliances. And so Washington warns about no, in, no permanent alliances and, and uh, Jefferson warns about no entangling alliances. So much of US foreign policy is really, how do, we, how do we involve ourselves without being part of an alliance? When we joined World War I in 1917, Wilson did so as an associated power, not as an allied power. And then the events of 1947-49 not, were not planned by any means or a response to actions on the ground. But that was the start of America creating an alliance system that has been quite unique uh, in the international order. Uh, for people like me, it was the framework that we, we worked in during the Cold War and after the Cold War, true for the ambassador as well. And the question is, what would that be today? What would that be going forward? The fourth is the role of, of public support and particularly Congress. This right. is often overlooked by foreign policy people, as, as you know, Steve. I mean, after all, you're the editor with The Hill. <laughs> um, and uh, even people like Kennan, for example, you can see why they never let him near Congress, because it would have been a disaster. And yet what I wanted to draw out here is for the United States to have a successful foreign policy, it needs to be embedded in public support. Whether in, in 1947-49, there was a man named Senator Vandenberg that played a critical role for Truman. Sort of in your period, you know, people like McCain and Luger and Nunn. There'll be a question who might step up to that uh, performance uh, today. I should mention it, that Vandenberg was a Republican in opposition to Truman. Right. And, yeah. and that was the key to part of Truman's uh, success to be able to get the Republican support, which actually were in the majority uh, in the first part of his, his term. And then the last one is America's purpose. In here, I avoid the provocative term of exceptionalism. But there's always an idea from the start of the United States that there was some, some larger purpose to, to the, the country's foreign policy. And the best way I can explain it is that um, for those of you that still carry a wallet, someday take out your wallet and look at the back of a dollar bill. You'll see the great seal of the United States. And as part of that great seal, you'll see this unfinished pyramid. And notice it's unfinished. You have the eye of providence above it. And the phrase below, novus order seclorum, new order of the ages. So they were thinking in rather big terms. Now, it's my thesis that the notion of that purpose evolves over 200 years. First, it's just to survive as a republic in a world of empires. Then uh, it's, the, it's to preserve the union uh, in, in the civil war. By the turn of the century, it's starting to be a rising power on the world stage. For Woodrow Wilson, it was to make the world safe for democracy, not necessarily to make it into democracies, but make it safe. Um, in the Cold War, it's the, or, or World War II, it's the Four Freedoms. In the Cold War, it's the leader of the free world. For Bill Clinton, it's uh, uh, the enlargement. So what will it be today? And I, I think there's three factors that have influenced it. One, um, the international context. Uh, second will be um, uh, public support. And then third will be some notion of human rights or freedom or Republican, small r Republicanism. And frankly, I, I think you'll see this in the Biden administration. This will be a big part of the relationships with Europe, sort of recognizing the common role of democracies given the rise of China. Look, there's so much to get into. There are you know, areas, for instance, I want to remind people um, that I believe during the George W. Bush administration, you gave the, the big speech on China, which is China has a choice. It has a choice on whether it should 
set as its aspiration becoming a responsible stakeholder in the global liberal order, in the global system. You were also, um, I believe, in the George H.W. Bush administration, one of those responsible for managing the, the Soviet Union dissolving and bringing Germany back together and being there working at that moment with you know heavyweights like Scowcroft, uh, James Baker and others in that very interesting time, which I'd like to get in both. But I think those may come up in questions. So I'm going to leave that for a moment. I want to ask you just two quick things before we begin to go to our audience is one, you know, what wh what do you think the biggest mistakes, if there are, if you see it that way of the Trump administration are, if you can put them into a quick soundbite. And second, uh, your neighbor, uh, Anthony Blinken, is about to step into the role of Secretary of State, and you know him very well. We Many of us know him very well. You know, what, what are his biggest opportunities right now? What would you advise him uh, to do coming into this role? So uh, Trump, in a sense, is the antithesis of what I described about with those five traditions. And, uh, you know, people are quite a well aware by now. He was very transactional as opposed to looking at systems and alliances and others. Um, he also, uh, I, I think it's, it's always the case that a president's foreign policy derives from with his or her domestic policy. But in the case of Trump, it's, it was important to remember that his political strength was as, as a disruptor. Um, he, was, he was challenging the system. And so when you look at issues such as immigration and the wall with, with Mexico, this was always part of his credibility with and his authenticity with his domestic base. So, you know, when he didn't get the funding, some people thought he would stop. I was quite convinced he would do something again because he, he couldn't retreat from that issue. Trade was in a similar category. And then he wanted to be different from his predecessors. So whether they were Republican or Democrat. So Obama did the Iran deal. He had to walk away from it. No president had gone to North Korea. So he went into North Korea. So I think what you see is a, a pattern of, of, of disruption. And then of course, it's no secret behind it all was a very narcissistic you know, ego driving, driving this policy, which actually led him to be more comfortable with authoritarian leaders than he was with, with uh, fellow Democrats. So um, if, I, if I think about uh, the situation for, for Tony Blinken today, I'd come back to this point we mentioned about, about Congress. Um, particularly given the likelihood that the Republicans will hold the Senate. Um, you know, one of the pieces of advice is, which frankly I, I did give the transition team was that, you know, you, you try to, you need to call the, not only the foreign relations committee and the leadership and the appropriators, but as also, you know, what we call the 150 account, the people who do the foreign policy spending. And that is also, as the ambassador knows, a secretary of state that is seen as influential with the Congress will have more influence abroad that we've seen as powerful. That was part of the benefit of when I worked for Baker for eight years. Um, in addition, it would make him more powerful within the administration to have those ties. Um, and it will also ultimately make him more influential uh, at, at the State Department. But then I think um, we're at a point now, and Ambassador and I were chatting a little bit about this, where obviously the Biden administration's got a huge domestic agenda. And Going back to Baker again, recall in 1981, he said to Reagan, Mr. President, you have three priorities, economic recovery, economic recovery, and economic <laughs> recovery. Well, for Biden, it's pandemic and economic recovery, and that will be his preoccupation. They've got somebody like Jeff Zients as the coordinator, who's a very capable person. But I think what you'll see on the international side is they'll leverage some of those issues. So whether it be, uh, foreign policy people will refer to them as transnational issues, whether they be topics of climate, whether they be not only this pandemic, but future biological security, which is an ongoing problem. Um, issues of immigration would certainly relate to Mexico, just as immigration issues affect the European Union with its southern border. Um, and also uh, issues such as, such as data and the economics. And the challenge will be, how do you integrate those in your foreign policy without being seen as overlooking the traditional security issues, because then those are issues of nuclear proliferation or sort of regional powers or sort of authoritarian threats. You need to do both, because if you only do the transnational, frankly, you'll get attacked as sort of being weak on the traditional stronger agenda. But then I, what I would advise is to use that transnational agenda to rebuild ties with your alliance partners. That's a very natural agenda for Europe and, and your Pacific allies, 
And that will be the foundation of stronger relations for the two biggest challenges we face, which is the future of free societies and, and the rise of China. And so while I disagree with the Cold War analogy with China, one part that does apply, and you, you see this in my book with Kennedy and Atchison and Baker and Bush, the United States was always most effective when it built and strengthened its alliance ties before dealing with Moscow. And there was always a tension because there was a political need to mm. deal with Moscow. Well, I think right now the United States has got some homework to do with some of its uh, alliance ties. The last point is, you know, don't ignore the international economic topics. Uh, it's key to your long term strength. Um, I was telling the ambassador, I just published a piece in the Wall Street Journal today online. It'll be in the paper tomorrow. Uh, for those interested, we're talking about uh, the trade agenda because this will be challenging for uh, a Biden administration given some of the protectionist uh, constituencies. The last issue, I guess, as sort of an insider, is we'll, we're going to see some very interesting issues of internal coordination here. I'm sure the ambassador has already probably reported back on this, but when you have a former Secretary of State like Kerry, who is an activist and wants to do things, uh, and is more of a peer to Biden than, say, Tony Blinken would be, who was a staff person, you know, will he integrate the climate issue within larger foreign policy or will it kind of work on its own track? I would argue that you want to integrate it because, as I said, it's important with alliance relations, it's important with developing countries, it's important with China. This will put a particular burden, I think, on Jake Sullivan as the national security advisor. But that's always a challenge that administrations have, and we'll see how it works out. Just real quick, one little short thing. If you were on the French side of the equation, we made you Bob Zelik or something. You know, you were like on the uh, uh, working with Philippe on that side. You know, I guess my, 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 my question would be, what I imagine every ally of the United States is going to want to test America on whether it's really there for them again, whether it's really got their back, whether they can trust. They may like Biden. They may want to they may pine for what it was like in the past, but they're going to have something they want to see. If you were French, what would you want to see from the United States to prove that America's saw that that America's relationship with France and its alliance was solvent again? Well, I'd actually start you know, with I think President Macron has made some good points about sort of European uh, capacity. This sometimes gets debated about words, strategic autonomy and all these ideas. But the key point is, um, you know, the lesson of the Trump period is Europe will be better off if it does have some of the capacities that it, it can act on its own. I've had this discussion with Kissinger. I think it makes a better ally if it also brings a strategic perspective. Kissinger has warned that Europe could become, in his wonderful language, a strategic appendage of Eurasia. And because it's the nature, of course, the European integration project came out of economics. But now the question is, can it go to the political and strategy side? I'm not really worried about the security partnership. I mean, if you think of what the French are doing, I think, quite courageously in sub-Saharan Africa, you know, those to really make that work, you need intelligence, you need logistics, you need lift. That's very expensive. As I look at European defense budgets, frankly, there's a lot that the U.S. will still need to do for Europe. But so I, I, I think the question actually is, you know, Europe, of course, needs its own cohesion as part of a partnership with the United States. And then as for your notion of kind of, you know, I, I don't like so much the phrase of testing because this should be a deeper relationship. But I would say for opportunity, I think there will be opportunities uh, in, in work on, on a pandemic, for example. So my argument would be, don't only, if you're the United States, rejoin the WHO, but maybe come up with an initiative like President Bush 43 did for HIV AIDS to kind of really help the developing world, or frankly, draw on institutions like the World Bank and others, which are gonna be critical for actual vaccine distribution in developing countries. And then there's issues of developing country debt and others. There's a common interest here because, I mean, as France knows in particular, if Africa is not successful in security and development, those problems are going to move north. And that's where we have sort of a common interest. And similarly, I could go through it with, with climate agenda and others. The most challenging one will be data, but I think it's possible. I think, as, as I mentioned, I think uh, there's enough commonality here economically and the, there's enough fluidity in the politics to allow businesses to be able to operate with data across borders, to use artificial intelligence, but at the same time respect 
different views about privacy and, and, and sovereignty. That's great. Well, look, we have a first question. I'm going to ask the ambassador's team that when they let me know that somebody's got a question, I need to know that person's name. So I don't know the name of the person who wants to ask a question, but I'm going to welcome this person on. Uh, they're going to bring him on to ask a question about the, the time of the Civil War. So, uh, and I've been told now it's Nadim. Thanks for getting back to me. Nadim. Hello, Nadim. Well, maybe I'm going to ask Nadim's question. So, folks, this is not working. Sorry, Nadim. His question is, was there an inflection point in U.S. diplomacy just after the U.S. Civil War? And did it contribute to what is often called the first globalization? It's a good question. Um, well, it's quite interesting. Um, you know, uh, Secretary of State Seward, who was a very good partner with, um, with, with Lincoln. And he was kind of forgotten to history other than the purchase of Alaska until um, about the book about uh, Team of Rivals. Um, and uh, he had a very interesting kind of post-war vision. Um, and it, it's something that has been kind of lost in American thinking. But if you, if, you, if you read the statements of Americans in the 19th century, they had a very powerful idea of union. It was almost a mystical notion, and it was tested in the Civil War because of the original sin of slavery. After its success, they kind of had this notion of uh, confederal models. And remember, they're trying to mm. avoid the traditional European balance of power or, or alliances. They also had the notion of commerce as a magnet. And so, in fact, sort of Seward predated me on North America. He had this notion of North American Union, not through conquering territory, but in a sense through the economic draw. And recall, one important dimension was um, the, there had been the French uh, effort to install Maximilian on the throne in, uh, in Mexico. That failed with Benito Juarez, so he reestablished the Mexican Republic. That, by the way, is another interesting little French-American story. And But then recall, Canada was created in 1867, and that wasn't an accident. That's because London got kind of anxious that the United States might resent the problems that Americans thought London had created in the Civil War, and uh, the United States might march north. So they took the four western or four eastern provinces, and North America Act created Canada. And the wonderful story was Seward wanted to actually acquire British Columbia. It's one of the great missed opportunities. There was there was actually a movement in, in British Columbia to join the United States, but the new Canadian government reached out and said, "What do you want to join Canada?" And they said, "Well, we want a transcontinental railway." and we want you to help with some of our debts. Um, but also to give you a little sense of, of uh, beyond the purchase of Alaska, um, uh, Seward acquires what's called Midway Island, which some of you may recall ends up sure. playing a big role in 1942. Um, he wanted to buy Hawaii. He was unsuccessful in doing this, uh, but he had a trade agreement that eventually created a dependency. He, he tried to buy the Virgin Islands, which uh, eventually we, didn't, we acquired around 1917. Um, and speaking of Trump, he wanted Greenland and Iceland as well. <laughs> so he, <laughs> he was ahead of Trump. But what he really was doing was he was trying to get the oceanic approaches. It really wasn't so much a notion of empire. It was sort of a notion of kind of the North American space. And then I think, as your question suggested, this is the rise of America as an industrial economic power. And so you'll see people, maybe Steve, when, when we went to school, people often refer to kind of isolationism in America. And this is often the European perspective. But what's critical to understand is it was an isolation from European security issues. Uh, it wasn't mm. an isolation from economic relationships by any means. And also on the, uh, uh, on, on the Pacific side, the United States was always more engaged, including actually, it's another chapter about the Naval Arms Control Conference of 1921, where France also plays a critical role. Well, we are trying to bring on stage, we're going to try this another time. We have Amy Rock, who's going to join us. Hi, Amy. The Hi, floor is yours. Good evening, gentlemen. Um, thank you for taking my question. Uh, quite simply, how is Brexit uh, going to complicate the rebuilding of our traditional alliances in Europe uh, for the Biden administration? That's an excellent question. And it's interesting, you know, probably like, like Steve, I have many contacts with, uh, with European groups. And it's quite interesting, the topics uh, 
almost never a deal with sort of what's going to happen with Brexit. And yet I think it's going to be fundamental going forward. Um, this, of course, really goes to a decision about what Britain wants to be. And that's being debated right now in terms of the final arrangement that it works out with the, the European Union. I think in a, in a way, there's a certain irony here. I, I've worked with the European Union and Britain's tension uh, for 20 or 30 years. I'm not sure the British ever really understood the nature of the European Union, where they keep trying to expect that there's plenty of negotiating room. And it's really, you know, a, a, a legal structure and framework from the start. And it's not so easy to kind of there's some maneuverability, but, but less than one thinks in terms of the nature of the arrangement. For the United States, uh, I, I think it's very important that Britain have constructive relationships with the European Union, but also with North America. So you'll see in the piece I wrote in the Wall Street Journal, one of my uh, arguments was that as opposed to just negotiating a trade agreement with the United States and Britain, we should do it with North America to stress the, the, the relationships that, that we have also with Mexico and Canada. And because trade, uh, the, the Trade Promotion Authority expires next year, and so that may be a challenge for the administration, I think that they could probably get an extension of that authority if they focused on, on doing something with Britain because of the political and security as well as the economic ideas. But I would also try to make it a state-of-the-art agreement. So what I mentioned about uh, uh, climate and carbon issues, um, to bring along the union's labor issues, but it seems hard to believe the unions could question the labor standards in Britain uh, as they might in some developing mm. countries. Um, and also some of the other uh, environmental issues and sort of data issues. And the reason I'm emphasizing all this is that I think you see two trends in Britain. There's a certain school that says, oh, we wanna be in Atlantic Singapore. I, I'm not sure that's really gonna be capable uh, given the politics. The other is what's in a sense, a little Englander uh, attitude of kind of retreat. And uh, it, it, it's interesting you ask that the London School of Economics uh, created an economic diplomacy commission to look at the future of Britain. And they asked a few Auslander, me being one of them, to sort of comment on it. And uh, my first point was to say, uh, don't get any smaller. So be very <laughs> careful about losing Scotland because I think that would send a negative view. And then frankly, a lot of it depends on their economic policies at home. But you're, you're, you're right to focus on it because it's, it's one of those critical hinge points where if we're not careful and the British aren't careful, you know, it, it, it will become less significant on the stage of international politics. For, for people like me who deal a lot with Asia, the world is moving forward. And so I believe it's in Europe's interest and the US interest to keep Britain part of the game and, and I'm glad, glad to see greater expenditure on the defense side. They're going to have to focus their resources. But you know, this is part of the challenge of diplomacy. How do you encourage people to do what you hope is in their interest, but your interest too? Amy, thanks so much for joining us. Now I'm going to go to Chip Sharp, and I'm going to ask Chip's question. Chip asks, um, let's see here. He asks, how will TPP affect our Asia Pacific trade negotiations. And before you answer it, I have also people messaging me on my home phone. And this is from Marilyn Gwax, a, a related question. Marilyn, of course, was the former chief business correspondent for National Public Radio. And she asks, um, did Mitch McConnell ruin the hope for a better Asia by sabotaging TPP? So I'll ask you to kind of do the TPP questions as a package. Well, uh, I'll start. Uh, with your, your observation about Cordell Hull, and let me explain why. <laughs> um, part of the idea with, with TPP, recall, is when the U.S. negotiated with 11 other economies, six of them we already had free trade agreements with. And that's exactly the model that I was trying to create sort of uh, er, earlier on 2001 to 2005. You wanted to use these free trade agreements to sort of uh, expand the state of the art, different services, intellectual property, labor and environmental standards, you would have never been able to negotiate TPP um, if you didn't have uh, that six of the countries were frankly very comfortable with the framework from prior negotiations. And I, to be honest, I think that the fault here lies with delay on the Obama administration. And to be honest, in their very first term, as Steve knows, they didn't want to do anything on trade. It's a little bit like I'm trying to warn now for the Biden administration. In the second term, they recognized the importance of it. Now, I've discussed this with Tom Donlan, who told me he showed some charts to President Obama and emphasized how the United States was losing out in the Asian economy. 
So Mike Froman became the U.S. Trade Representative and he, he negotiated the TPP. But this is where timing, my story about Ben Franklin it is very relevant. The Trade Promotion Authority was passed in 2015 by Paul Ryan. Paul Ryan, the Speaker of the House, was really committed to this. If they had gotten that agreement done in 2015, mm. it would have passed the Congress. But they waited until 2016. So they wasted four years and they didn't quite get the next one done in time. And so, of course, as we approach the election, you had both uh, Hillary Clinton and Trump uh, opposing it. Now, the next lesson that's quite intriguing, and I wouldn't have expected this, but Japan stepped forward of the other 11 and said, I want to keep this going. And that right. wouldn't have been the Japan that I had worked with in sort of prior decades. It's it wasn't the Japan at the beginning of TPP. Right. And, and, it's a, and it's a wonderful comment about Japan sort of stepping up. But it's also a warning to the United States, which is that when we decide to sort of withdraw in our own politics, it doesn't mean the rest of the world stops. And so there is a TPP. It's just the U.S. isn't part of it. Now, there's also an RCEP, which is 15 uh, Asian economies, including some in TPP, but including China. It's a different type of agreement. It doesn't go into the same detail, but it, it's going to be quite important with rules of origin and shaping the posture. Then that's exactly how I start off my op-ed by saying, look, the world is moving ahead on these issues and the United States is not in the game. So Bob Lighthizer uh, wrote a piece, I forget it was in the Financial Times or others sort of complaining about the European Union negotiating agreements. And I thought, well, this is a little cheeky because if, if you don't sit at the table, you don't get to have a say in the rules. And we not only weren't sitting at the table, but we were trying to throw off the table of the WTO. So this is the price we pay for some of these domestic politics and protectionism. Well, let me bring Mike Nelson, a good friend who knows more about IT policy than just about anybody, but Mike Nelson of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Mike, good to see you. Good to see you. This has been fascinating and good to see you, Bob. Uh, this is a question about diplomacy, history, and technology. So if you look back over the last 120, 150 years, Clinton and Gore, promoted the internet and that changed the world. JFK promoted communication satellites and made a difference. And Lincoln probably won the Civil War because he understood how to use the telegraph. And robot. Do you know if they're, they really made a difference? Was that just, you know, sort of window dressing and cheerleading or did they, did they make a difference? And is there something Biden could embrace? Is there some technology that's on the cusp and with a little presidential leadership, we could see the, the globe benefiting from it much faster and much more universally? So this is a wonderful question. And uh, when you get a chance to read the book, you'll see I included a chapter on Van Everbush. And I did this precisely to address- your Is that, how, let me stop you. Is that how to pronounce, because I've always said Vanabar. Is How do you pronounce it? Van Ever, it's Dutch. Okay, good. Well, that's good to know. We now um, stand corrected. No, Go that, ahead. That's because, see, you, you, you learn things when you read them, but uh, for those <laughs> of us in oral context. So I, I wanted to include Bush, Van Ever Bush, because I, I treat him as the godfather of an American diplomacy that embraces scientific and technological change. And the book includes geopolitics. As we've talked about, I try to integrate a lot of economics, but I wanted to stress the role of science and technology. And as you may know, um, then Ever Bush was a vice president at MIT. He was a sort of a polymath engineer. He, he was uh, he did a lot of things with his hands. He was he was not only a thinker and a brilliant person, but he was kind of an apparatus man. And he also became head of the Carnegie Institution of Science in Washington. He used that platform in World War II. Basically, reaches out to to Roosevelt to sort of create a group of people that will focus on how do we apply America's technology in World War II, where the military was a little slow on this. And, and he comes up with the notion of contracts to draw in people from universities and, and, and business. Um, this was critical in the U-boat campaign, where they basically integrate sort of different capacities, the proximity fuse, radar, and of course, he's the principal liaison for the atomic bomb. So in 1944, he, also, he, he works with the White House to get Roosevelt to send him a letter to say, what will happen to science policy after World War II? And for those in the science field, this is a well-known set of example. He produces this report called Science, the Endless Frontier. So as opposed to geopolitical frontiers, it's the scientific frontier. And you'll see in the chapter, there's a lot of politics about what came out of it. But at Stanford, they call this the triple helix model. 
and they mean basic scientific research by the U.S. government, use of it, universities, then the business sector. But at, at a political level, what, what, what he's trying to do is he said, look, we have a free society and scientists are often mavericks. How do you create a place for free thinkers within a national security system? And that's, in my view, one of the reasons why the United States and the West was successful against the Soviet Union. You can definitely see this in the 1980s, where in a sense their innovation sort of runs aground. I think it'll be quite important in the challenge with China, and we'll see whether the state-owned system of China uh, is more successful. But I also want to include it because I think there's a challenge of diplomacy with science and public policy issues. This is another coincidence of the Zelig-like examples that, uh, that Steve mentioned. I, I was in charge of the U.S. negotiations for the Global Climate Framework Treaty in 1992, mm -hmm. the only one, by the way, that's ever been ratified. And it's the basis for the Paris Accord and all the other agreements because it creates the, the framework for these uh, national action plans. I think we're going to see more of that, whether it's pandemic issues or climate issues. How do you combine you know, the science and technology with diplomacy? I, I, I did a lot of this at, at the World Bank as well. But one last thing about Bush, just to give you, you, you can't make this up. It's such so fascinating. In, in July of 45, not only does he witness the first atomic bomb text, and does he issue this report? But he writes an article for the Atlantic magazine where he imagines something he calls the Memex machine. And basically what he's doing is he has the concept of the personal computer 30 or 40 years in advance of it. But a, uh, a radar technician who goes off to Leyte in the Philippines comes across a reprint of this article on a Red Cross library on stilts. He goes back and becomes an, a, a computer engineer and is really the founder, uh, the father of the personal computer. One of Vanderveer's Bush's uh, graduate students becomes provost at Stanford and starts something called Silicon Valley. <laughs> so, so I would say uh, definitely there's a there's a need to integrate science and technology into foreign policy. Mike, there's thanks a great for joining report us. that came out today from the National Academy on how to make the State Department more effective in this area. So, well, well this will be one of the challenges. Great answer. Thank you. Well, Mike, Mike Nelson, thank you. We're getting right down near the end. I've got a, uh, uh, another question from Nick Thomas, who, who, who asked an interesting question. He says, you know, you, you, basically you and John Bolton were both in the James Baker um, circle. You are known as a pragmatist. John Bolton is less known as a pragmatist and maybe more as a, um, I, I, he has a name here, but I'll just say, uh, a more dogmatic ideologue. So how did you both come out of the Baker um, circle and end up so differently? Well, I want to be a little diplomatic about this, but I think my relationship with Baker is a little different. <laughs> <laughs> I, I worked for him. I started working for him at the Treasury for three years. I was then with him in the Bush campaign in 88. Uh, uh, John was part of our team and he respected Baker, but I think if you look at the close-in team with the German unification at the end of the Cold War and others, sure. Sure John would have made the cut uh, when it was the 2000 recount. John was down there working there, but I was kind of the one uh, operationalizing things. So uh, taking nothing away from John and, and Baker respected what John brought to the process, but I guess I'll let historians judge. Well, well maybe we can dovetail into this as final, a final comment, what you really are known for, which is pragmatism in foreign policy. And, and, where that fits in, how you how do, how does the Robert Zellick code to foreign policy treat pragmatism in our history? Well, and this is I, you know I think for the ambassador and his and his team this will this will, I hope will resonate, and that is um, you know like you Steve, while I enjoy sort of reading some of the academic work in the field, what I was trying to draw out is I think in the practical world of foreign policy, I have a certain wariness of abstractions and trying to force messy facts uh, into theoretical boxes. Hmm. So in, a, in the heart, right. what Baker was about was results and kind of that involves connecting means and ends. It really is also kind of a, a, a diplomatic model of, of looking closely at the reality of, of situation on the ground. Power, whether it's military, economic, uh, technologies we've discussed, uh, sometimes votes, uh, processes and institutions. How do things actually get done? Uh, positions of others, what are their interests, uh, timing. And I guess, uh, contrary to perhaps some critical studies people, I think 
accepting imperfect results in a far from perfect world is still uh, uh, a respectable result. And so in that sense, what I try to do in this book is to have history offer insights on how to do better, not the acceptance of timeless obstacles. So I'll be interested for, for the embassy staffs in town. I, it's interesting that the Canadian and Australian teams have told me they're using the book with their, their diplomatic education because there's, there's a lot of what I hope will be practical insights here for diplomacy. Um, let me, so we have like a, one more minute uh, left. I'm gonna ask um, Andrea Fort, Andrea Fort, has a question. She notes um, that the fifth anniversary of the Paris Climate Accord is this Saturday, it's December 12th. And do you believe the United States will be able to catch up on its objectives? Will, will John Kerry be able to move America to catch up on those objectives? Um, I don't know for sure. The president has a lot of regulatory authority as we right. saw. But I guess what I would emphasize in this is not just rejoining the Paris Accord, but this is kind of goes to my diplomatic point. The next step, frankly, and this is something that Bush 43 started, but about seven years too late. This really depends about on 10 or 12 big economies. That's about 85 to 90 percent of the work. So you, it, it, it eases the diplomacy. But then also it's important to bring the developing world along. So what I argued and what I tried to do at the World Bank would be for sub-Saharan Africa, you could have soil carbon projects, soil carbon that helps absorb carbon could be quite important, but also help with African agriculture. You can have programs, obviously you need it with some of the island states with adaptation, with avoided forestation and deforestation. So this is actually a very good example of you need to combine the scientific and technological capacity with how do you bring people together in a project while recognizing that at the end of the day, there's going to be 10 or 12 major economies that get this done. And I think the, this will be one of the areas where you will see the Biden administration with, with Kerry kind of taking the lead. My, the key point I'd watch, however, would be if it's a key part of your foreign policy, why isn't it the Secretary of State's job? And so we'll have to see how that works. That, you know, that's what I call a tweetable moment. There is a little bit of a secret that if there's a, you know, a Jeopardy uh, question out there about, uh, you know, who, who may you be surprised you is on Twitter's board. Um, it's, it's Bob Zellick is on Twitter's board. So that is what I call a tweetable moment, a tweetable comment. Bob, do you have a copy of your book in front of you right now? I got one right behind me. So you may have, I mean, I was going to ask you if you had your book memorized, if you didn't, because I thought it would be appropriate. And it's a very powerful ending of your book. And you happen to, in your last line of your book, quote a French, a very famous Frenchman. So did you want me to read it? Is that Yes, the... unless you've got okay. it memorized and recite it. Okay, let's see. Well, I'm looking at the acknowledgments. Okay. Page 472. I expect America's leaders and citizens will continue to pursue these challenges pragmatically, trying what works. As Tocqueville observed almost two centuries ago, quote, the greatness of America lies not in being more enlightened than any other nation, but rather in her ability to repair her faults. I think that's a wonderful way to, to both talk about the French-American connection and the history of American foreign policy and diplomatic history. So congratulations, Bob. Thank you for sharing this book with us. Uh, I do commend it to people. I've worked it through it now. I have lots of little micro vignettes in my mind where and that is going to be great conversation for years. So Bob Zellick, thank you so much. Thank you to Philippe Etienne, the ambassador, to his entire staff, also to my staff at the Hill uh, for putting this program together. And most importantly, thank you to all of our listeners and participants that participated this evening. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Ambassador. Thanks to all. Thank you. Bye.